This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom Jones by Henry Fielding Chapter 4 In which Sophia is delivered from her confinement the squire and the parson for the landlord was now otherwise engaged were smoking their pipes together when the arrival of the lady was first signified the squire no sooner heard her name than he immediately ran down to usher her upstairs for he was a great observer of such ceremonials especially to his sister of whom he stood more in awe than of any other human creature though he never would own this nor did he perhaps know it himself mrs western on her arrival in the dining-room, having flung herself into a chair, began thus to harangue. "'Well, surely, no one ever had such an intolerable journey. I think the roads, since so many turnpike acts, are grown worse than ever. La, brother, how could you get into this odious place? No person of condition, I dare swear, ever set foot here before.' "'I don't know,' quires the squire. "'I think they do well enough.' It was landlord recommended them. I thought, as he knew most of the quality, he could best show me where to get among them. Well, and where's my niece? said the lady. Have you been to wait upon Lady Belaston yet? Ay, ay, cries the squire. Your niece is safe enough. She is upstairs in chamber. How? answered the lady. Is my niece in this house, and does she not know of my being here? no no body can well get to her says the squire for she is under lock and key i have her safe i fetched her for my lady cousin the first night i came into town and i have taken care of her ever since she is secure as a fox in a bag i promise you good heaven returned mrs weston what do i hear i thought what a fine piece of work would be the consequence of my consent to your coming to town yourself nay it was indeed your own headstrong will nor can i charge myself with having ever consented to it did not you promise me brother that you would take none of these headstrong measures was it not by these headstrong measures that you forced my niece to run away from you in the country have you a mind to oblige her to take such another step zounds and the devil cries the squire dashing his pipe on the ground did ever mortal hear the like when I expected you, would have commended me for all I have done to be fallen upon in this manner. How, brother, said the lady, have I ever given you the least reason to imagine I should commend you for locking up your daughter? Have I not often told you that women in a free country are not to be treated with such arbitrary power? We are as free as the men, and I heartily wish I could not say we deserve that freedom better. If you expect I should stay a moment longer in this wretched house, or that I should ever own you again as my relation, or that I should ever trouble myself again with the affairs of your family, I insist upon it that my niece be set at liberty this instant. This she spoke with so commanding an air, standing with her back to the fire, with one hand behind her and a pinch of snuff in the other, that I question whether Thalestris, at the end of the Albinsons, ever made a more tremendous figure it is no wonder therefore that the poor squire was not proof against the awe which she inspired there he cried throwing down the key there it is do whatever you please i only intended to have kept her up till bliffle came to town which can't be long and now if any harm happens in the meantime remember who it is to be blamed for it I will answer it with my life, cried Mrs. Western, but I shall not intermeddle at all, unless upon one condition, and that is that you will commit the whole entirely to my care, without taking one measure yourself, unless I shall eventually appoint you to act. If you ratify these preliminaries, brother, I yet will endeavour to preserve the honour of your family. If not, I shall continue in a neutral state. I pray you, good sir, said the parson. Permit yourself this once to be admonished by her ladyship. For adventure by communing with young Madam Sophia, she will effect more than you have been able to perpetrate by more rigorous measures. What? Does thee open up on me? cries the squire. If thee dost begin to babble, I shall whip thee in presently. 
Fie, brother, answered the lady, is this language to a clergyman? Mr. Supple is a man of sense, and gives you the best advice, and the whole world, I believe, will concur in his opinion. But I must tell you, I expect an immediate answer to my categorical proposals. Either cede your daughter to my disposal, or take her wholly to your own surprising discretion, and then I here, before Mr. Supple, evacuate the garrison, and renounce you and your family for ever. I pray you let me be a mediator, cries the parson. Let me supplicate you. Why, there lies the key on the table, cries the squire. She may take it up, if she pleases, who enters her? No, brother, answers the lady. I insist on the formality of its being delivered to me, with a full ratification of all the concessions stipulated. Why, then I will deliver it to you. Here it is, cries the squire. I am sure, sister. You can't accuse me of ever denying to trust my daughter to you. She hath lived with you a whole year and more to a time without my ever seeing her. And it would have been happy for her, answered the lady, if she had always lived with me. Nothing of this kind would have ever happened under my eye. I certainly, cries he, I only am to blame. Why, you are to blame, brother, answered she. I have been often obliged to tell you so, and shall always be obliged to tell you so. However, I hope you will now amend, and gather so much experience from past errors, as not to defeat my wisest machinations from your blunders. Indeed, brother, you are not qualified for these negotiations. All your whole scheme of politics is wrong. I once more, therefore, insist that you do not intermeddle. Remember only what is past. Zounds and blood, sister, cries the squire. What would you have me say? You are enough to provoke the devil. There now, says she, just according to the old system, I see. Brother, there is no talking to you. I will appeal to Mr. Supple, who is a man of sense, if I said anything which could put any human creature into a passion. But you are so wrong-headed every way. Let me beg you, madam, said the parson, not to irritate his worship. Irritate him, said the lady. Sure, you are as great a fool as himself. Well, brother, since you have promised not to interfere, I will once more undertake the management of my niece. Lord have mercy upon all affairs which are under the directions of men. The head of one woman is worth a thousand of yours. And now, having summoned a servant to show her to Sophia, she departed, bearing the key with her. She was no sooner gone than the squire, having first shut the door, ejaculated twenty bitches, and as many hearty curses against her, not sparing himself for having ever thought of her estate, but added, Now one hath been a slave for so long, it would be pity to lose it at last, for one of holding out a little longer. The bitch can't live for ever and I know I am down for it upon the will. The parson greatly commended the resolution, and now the squire, having ordered in another bottle, which was his usual method when anything either pleased or vexed him, did, by drinking plentifully of this medicinal julep, so totally wash away his choler that his temper was become perfectly placid and serene, when Mrs. Western returned with Sophia into the room. The young lady had on her hat and capuchin, and the aunt acquainted Mr. Weston that she intended to take her niece with her to her own lodgings. For indeed, brother, says she, these rooms are not fit to receive a Christian soul in. Very well, madam, quoth Weston, whatever you please. The girl can never be in better hands than yours, and the parson here can do me the justice to say that I have said fifty times behind your back that you was one of the most sensible women in the world. To this, cries the parson, I am ready to bear testimony. Nay, brother, said Mrs. Western, I have always, I am sure, given you as favourable a character. You must own you have a little too much hastiness in your temper. But when you will allow yourself time to reflect, I never knew a man more reasonable. Why then, sister, if you think so, said the squire, 
Here's your good elf with all my heart. I'm a little passionate sometimes, but I scorn to bear any malice. Sophie, do you be a good girl, and do everything your aunt orders you. I have not the least doubt of her, answered Mrs. Western. She has had already an example before her eyes in the behaviour of that wretch, her cousin Harriet, who ruined herself by neglecting my advice. Oh, brother, what think you? You was hardly gone out of hearing when you set out for London, when who should arrive but that impudent fellow with the odious Irish name, that Fitzpatrick? He broke in abruptly upon me without notice, or I would not have seen him. He ran on a long, unintelligible story about his wife, to which he forced me to give him a hearing, but I made him very little answer, and delivered him the letter from his wife, which I bid him answer himself. I suppose the wretch will endeavour to find us out, but I beg you will not see her, for I am determined I will not. I see her, answered the squire. You need not fear me. I'll get no encouragement to such undutiful wenches. It is well for the fellow, her husband. I was not at home. I'd rabbit it. He should have taken a dance through the horse pond. I promise on. You see, Sophie, what undutifulness brings folks to? You have an example in your own family. Brother, cries the aunt, you need not shock my niece by such odious repetitions. Why will you not leave everything entirely to me? Well, I will, I will, I will, said the squire. And now Mrs. Western, luckily for Sophia, put an end to the conversation by ordering chairs to be called. I say luckily, for had it continued much longer, fresh matter of dissension would, most probably, have arisen between the brother and the sister, between whom education and sex made the only difference, for both were equally violent and equally positive. They both had a vast affection for Sophia, and both a sovereign contempt for each other. Chapter 5 In which Jones receives a letter from Sophia, and goes to a play with Mrs. Miller and Partridge. The arrival of Black George in town, and the good offices which that grateful fellow had promised to do for his old benefactor, greatly comforted Jones in the midst of all the anxiety and uneasiness which he had suffered on the account of Sophia, from whom, by the means of the said George, he received the following answer to his letter, which Sophia, to whom the use of pen, ink, and paper was restored with her liberty, wrote the very evening when she departed from her confinement. Sir, as I do not doubt your sincerity in what you write, you will be pleased to hear that some of my afflictions are at an end. By the arrival of my aunt Weston, with whom I am at present, and with whom I enjoy all the liberty I can desire, one promise my aunt hath insisted on my making, which is that I will not see or converse with any person without her knowledge and consent. This promise I have most solemnly given, and shall most inviolably keep, and though she hath not expressly forbidden me writing, yet that must be an omission from forgetfulness, or this, perhaps, is included in the words conversing. However, as I cannot but consider this as a breach of her generous confidence in my honour, you cannot expect that I shall, after this, continue to write myself, or to write letters without her knowledge. A promise is with me a very sacred thing, and to be extended to everything understood from it, as well as to what is expressed by it, and by this consideration may, perhaps on reflection, afford you some comfort. But why should I mention a comfort to you of this kind? For though there is one thing in which I can never comply with the best of fathers, yet am I firmly resolved never to act in defiance of him, or to take any step of consequence without his consent. A firm persuasion of this must teach you to divert your thoughts from what fortune hath, perhaps, made impossible. This your own interest persuades you. This may reconcile, I hope, Mr. Allworthy to you. And, if it will, you have my injunctions to pursue it. Accidents have laid some obligations on me, and your good intentions probably more. Fortune may, perhaps, be some time kinder to us both than at present. Believe this that I shall always think of you as I think you deserve, and am, sir, your obliged humble servant, Sophia Western. 
I charge you, write to me no more, at present at least, and accept this, which is now of no service to me, which I know you must want, and think you owe the trifle only to that fortune by which you found it. Meaning, perhaps, the bank bill for a hundred. A child who has just learnt his letters would have spelt this letter out in less time than Jones took in reading it. The sensations it occasioned were a mixture of joy and grief, somewhat like what divide the mind of a good man when he pursues the will of his deceased friend, and which a large legacy which his distresses make the more welcome is bequeathed to him. Upon the whole, however, he was more pleased than displeased, and indeed the reader may probably wonder that he was displeased at all, but the reader is not quite so much in love as was poor Jones, and love is a disease which, though it may in some instances resemble a consumption, which it sometimes causes, in others proceeds in direct opposition to it, and particularly in this that it never flattens itself, or sees any one symptom in a favourable light. One thing gave him complete satisfaction, which was that his mistress had regained her liberty, and was now with a lady where she might at least assure herself of a decent treatment. Another comfortable circumstance was the reference which she made to her promise of never marrying any other man, for however disinterested he might imagine his passion, and notwithstanding all the generous overtures made in his letter, I very much question whether he could have heard a more afflicting piece of news than that Sophia was married to another. Though the match had been never so great, and never so likely to end in making her completely happy, that refined degree of platonic affection which is absolutely detached from the flesh, and is indeed entirely and purely spiritual, is a gift confined to the female part of the creation, many of whom I have heard declare, and doubtless with great truth, that they would, with the utmost readiness, resign a lover to a rival, when such resignation was proved to be necessary for the temporal interest of such lover. Hence, therefore, I conclude that this affection is in nature, though I cannot pretend to say I have ever seen an instance of it. Mr. Jones, having spent three hours in reading and kissing the aforesaid letter, and being, at last, in a state of good spirits, from the last mentioned considerations, he agreed to carry an appointment which he had before made into execution. This was to attend Mrs. Miller, and her younger daughter, into the gallery at the playhouse, and to admit Mr. Partridge as one of the company. For as Jones had really that taste for humour which may affect, he expected to enjoy much entertainment in the criticisms of Partridge, from whom he expected the simple dictates of nature, unimproved, indeed, but likewise unadulterated by art. In the first row, then, of the first gallery did Mr. Jones, Mrs. Miller, her youngest daughter, and Partridge take their places. Partridge immediately declared it was the finest place he had ever been in. When the first music was played, he said, It is a wonder how so many fiddlers could play at one time without putting one another out. While the fellow was lighting the opera candles, he cried out to Mrs. Miller, Look, look, madame, the very picture of the man in the end of the common prayer book for the gunpowder treason service. Nor could he help observing, with a sigh, when all the candles were lighted, that here were candles enough burnt in one night to keep an honest poor family for a whole twelve month. As soon as the play, which was Hamlet, Prince of Denmark, began, Partridge was all attention, nor did he break silence till the entrance of the ghost. Upon which he asked Jones, what man that was in a strange dress something, he said, like what I have seen in a picture. Sure, it is not armour, is it? Jones answered, That is the ghost, to which Partridge replied with a smile. Persuade me that you, sir, if you can, though I can't say I ever actually saw a ghost in my life, yet I am certain I should know one if I saw him, better than that comes to. No, no, sir, ghosts don't appear in such dresses as that neither. In this mistake 
which caused much laughter in the neighbourhood of Partridge, he was suffered to continue till the scene between the ghost and Hamlet, when Partridge gave that credit to Mr. Garrick, which he had denied to Jones, and fell into so violent a trembling that his knees knocked against each other. Jones asked him what was the matter, and whether he was afraid of the warrior upon the stage. "'Oh, la, sir,' said he, "'I perceive now it is what you told me. I am not afraid of anything, for I know it is but a play, and if it was really a ghost, it could do one no harm at such a distance, and in so much company, and yet if I was frightened, I am not the only person.' "'Why, who?' cries Jones. Dost thou take to be such a coward as here besides thyself? Nay, you may call me coward if you will, but if that little man there upon the stage is not frightened, I never saw any man frightened in my life. Ay, ay, go along with you. Ay, to be sure, who's fool then, will you? Lud have mercy upon such foolhardiness. Whatever happens, it is good enough for you. Follow you? I'd follow the devil as soon. Nay, perhaps it is the devil, for they say he can put on what likeness he pleases. Oh, the here he is again. No, farther. No, you have gone far enough already, farther than I'd have gone for all the king's dominions. Jones offered to speak, but Partridge cried, Hush, hush, dear sir, don't you hear him? And during the whole speech of the ghost, he sat with his eyes fixed partly on the ghost and partly on Hamlet, and with his mouth open. The same passions succeeded each other in Hamlet, succeeding likewise in him. When the scene was over, Jones said, Why, Partridge, you exceed my expectations. You enjoy the play more than I conceived possible. Nay, sir, answered Partridge, if you are not afraid of the devil, I can't help it. But to be sure, it is natural to be surprised at such things, though I know there is nothing in them, nor that it was the ghost that surprised me neither, for I should have known that to have been only a man in a strange dress. But when I saw the little man so frightened himself, it was that which took hold of me. And dost thou imagine then, Partridge, cries Jones, that he was really frightened? Nay, sir, answered Partridge, if you are not afraid of the devil, I can't help it. But to be sure, it is natural to be surprised at such things, though I know there is nothing in them. Not that it was a ghost that surprised me neither, for I should have known that to have been only a man in a strange dress. But when I saw the little man so frightened himself, it was that which took hold of me. And dost thou imagine then, Partridge, cries Jones, that he was really frightened? Nay, sir, said Partridge, did not yourself observe afterwards that when he found it was his own father's spirit, and how he was murdered in the garden, how his fear forsook him by degrees, and he was struck dumb with sorrow, as it were, just as I should have been had it been my own case. But hush! Oh, la! What noise is that? Here he is again! Well, to be certain, though I know there is nothing at all in it, I am glad I am not down yonder where those men are. Then turning his eyes again upon Hamlet, I... You may draw your sword. What signifies a sword against the power of the devil? During the second act, Partridge made very few remarks. He greatly admired the fineness of the dresses, nor could he help observing the king's countenance. Well, said he, how people may be deceived by faces. Nulla fides fronti is, I find, a true saying. Who would think by looking in the king's face, that he had ever committed a murder. He then inquired after the ghost, but Jones, who intended he should be surprised, gave him no other satisfaction than that he might possibly see him again soon, and in a flash of fire. Partridge sat in fearful expectation of this, and now, when the ghost made his next appearance, Partridge cried out, There, sir, now, what say you now? Is he frightened now or no? As much frightened as you think me, and to be sure, nobody can help some fears. I would not be in so bad a condition as what's his name? Squire Hamlet is there for all the world. Bless me, what's become of his spirit? As I am a living soul, 
I thought I saw him sink into the earth. Indeed, you saw right, answered Jones. Well, well, cries Partridge. I know it is only a play, and besides, if there was anything in all this, Madame Miller would not laugh so, for as to you, sir, you would not be afraid. I believe if the devil was here in person... Ah, they are there! Ay, no wonder you in such a passion shake the vile, wicked wretch to pieces. If she was my own mother, I would serve her so. To be sure, all duty to her mother is forfeited by such wicked doings. I go about your business. I hate the sight of you. Our critic was now pretty silent till the play which Hamlet introduces before the king. This he did not at first understand till Jones explained it to him, but he no sooner entered into the spirit of it that he began to place himself that he had never committed murder. Then, turning to Mrs. Miller, he asked her if she did not imagine the king looked as if he was touched, though he is, said he, a good actor, and doth all he can to hide it. Well, I would not have so much to answer for as that wicked man there hath to sit upon a much higher chair than he sits upon. No wonder he ran away. For your sake I'll never trust an innocent face again. The grave-digging scene next engaged the attention of Partridge, who expressed much surprise at the number of skulls thrown upon the stage, to which Jones answered that it was one of the most famous burial places around town. No wonder, then, cries Partridge, that the place is haunted, but I never saw in my life a worse grave digger. Th I had a sexton, when I was a clerk, that should have dug three graves while he is digging one. That fellow handles a spade as if it was the first time he had ever had one in his hand. Ay, ay, you may sing. You had rather sing than work, I believe. Upon Hamlet's taking up the skull, he cried out, well, it is strange to see how fearless some men are. I never could bring myself to touch anything belonging to a dead man on any account. He seemed frightened enough, too, at the ghost. I thought Nemo omnibus oris sapit. Little more worth remembering occurred during the play, at the end of which Jones asked him which of the players he had liked best. To this he answered, with some appearance of indignation at the question, The king, no doubt. Indeed, Mr. Partridge, said Mrs. Miller, you are not of the same opinion with the town, for they are all agreed that Hamlet is acted by the best player who ever was on the stage. He the best player? cries Partridge with a contemptuous sneer. Why, I could act as well as he myself. I am sure if I had seen a ghost, I should have looked in the very same manner, and done just as he did, and then to be sure in that scene, as you called it, between him and his mother, where you told me he acted so fine, why, Lord, help me, any man, that is, any good man, that had such a mother, would have done exactly the same. I know you are only joking with me, but indeed, madam, Though I was never to play in London, yet I have seen acting before in the country, and the king for my money. He speaks all his words distinctly, half as loud again as the other. Anybody may see he is an actor. While Mrs. Miller was thus engaged in conversation with Partridge, a lady came up to Mr. Jones, who he immediately knew to be Mrs. Fitzpatrick. She said she had seen him from the other part of the gallery, and had taken that opportunity of speaking to him, as she had something to say which might be of great service to himself. She then acquainted him with her lodgings, and made him an appointment the next day in the morning, which, upon recollection, she presently changed to the afternoon, at which time Jones promised to attend her. Thus ended the adventure at the playhouse, where Partridge had offered great mirth, not only to Jones and Mrs. Miller, but to all who sat within hearing, who were more attentive to what he said than to anything that passed on the stage. He durst not go to bed all that night, for fear of the ghost, and many nights after sweated two or three hours before he went to sleep, with the same apprehensions, and waked several times in great horrors, crying out, Lord, have mercy upon us! There it is!
Chapter 6 In which the history is obliged to look back. It is almost impossible for the best parent to observe an exact impartiality to his children, even though no superior merit should bias his affection. But sure, a parent can hardly be blamed when that superiority determines his preference. As I regard all the personages of this history in the light of my children, so I must confess the same inclination of partiality to Sophia, and for that I hope the reader will allow me the same excuse from the superiority of her character. This extraordinary tenderness, which I have for my heroine, never suffers me to quit her any long time without the utmost reluctance. I could now, therefore, return impatiently to inquire what hath happened to this lovely creature since her departure from her father's, but that I am obliged first to pay a short visit to Mr. Bliffle. Mr. Western, in the first confusion into which his mind was cast upon, the sudden news he received of his daughter, and in the first hurry to go after her, had not once thought of sending any account of the discovery to Bliffle. He had not gone far, however, before he recollected himself, and accordingly stopped at the very first inn he came to, and dispatched away a messenger to acquaint Bliffle with his having found Sophia, and with his firm resolution to marry her to him immediately, if he would come up after him to town. As the love which Bliffle had for Sophia was of that violent kind which nothing but the loss of her fortune or some such accident could lessen, his inclination to the match was not at all altered by her having run away, though he was obliged to lay this to his own account. He very readily, therefore, embraced this offer. Indeed, he now proposed the gratification of a very strong passion, besides avarice, by marrying this young lady, and this was hatred for he concluded that matrimony offered an equal opportunity of satisfying either hatred or love, and this opinion is very probably verified by much experience. To say the truth, if we are to judge by the ordinary behaviour of married persons to each other, we shall perhaps be apt to conclude that the generality seek the indulgence of the former passion only in their union of everything but of hearts. There was one difficulty, however, in his way, and this arose from Mr. Allworthy, that good man, when he found by the departure of Sophia, for neither that nor the cause of it could be concealed from him, the great aversion which he had for his nephew, began to be seriously concerned that he had been deceived into carrying matters so far. He by no means concurred with the opinion of those parents who think it is immaterial to consult the inclinations of their children in the affair of marriage, as to solicit the good pleasure of their servants when they intend to take a journey, and who are, by law or decency at least, withheld often from using absolute force. On the contrary, as he esteemed the institution to be one of the most sacred kind, he thought every preparatory caution necessary to preserve it holy and inviolate, and very wisely concluded that the surest way to effect this was by laying the foundation in previous affection. Bliffle, indeed, soon cured his uncle of all anger on the score of deceit, by many vows and protestations that he had been deceived himself, with which the many declarations of Western very well tallied. But now to persuade Allworthy to consent to the renewing the addresses was a matter of such apparent difficulty that the very appearance was sufficient to have deterred a less enterprising genius. But this young gentleman so well knew his own talents that nothing within the province of cunning seemed to him hard to be achieved. Here, then, he represented the violence of his own affection and the hopes of subduing aversion in the lady by perseverance. He begged that, in an affair on which depended all his future repose, he might at least be at liberty to try all fair means for success. Heaven forbid, he said, that he should ever think of prevailing by any other than the most gentle methods. Besides, sir, said he, if they fail, you may then, which will be surely time enough, deny your consent. He urged the great and eager desire which Mr. Western had for the match, and lastly he made great use of the name of Jones, to whom he imputed all that had happened, and from whom he said to preserve so valuable a young lady was even an act of charity. All these arguments were well seconded by Thwackham, who dwelt a little stronger on the authority of parents than Mr. Bliffle himself had done. He ascribed the measures which Mr. Bliffle was desirous to make Christian motives. 
"'And though,' said he, "'the good young gentleman hath mentioned charity last, "'I am almost convinced it is his first and principal consideration.' Square, possibly, had he been present, would have sung to the same tune, though in a different key, and would have discovered much moral fitness in the proceeding, but he was now gone to Bath for the recovery of his health. Allworthy, though not without reluctance, at last yielded to the desires of his nephew. He said he would accompany him to London, where he might be at liberty to use every honest endeavour to gain the lady. But I declare, said he, I will never give my consent to any absolute force being put on her inclinations, nor shall you ever have her, unless she can be brought freely to compliance. Thus did the affection of Allworthy for his nephew betray the superior understanding to be triumphed over by the inferior, and thus is the prudence of the best of heads often defeated by the tenderness of the best of hearts. Bluffel, having obtained this unhoped-for acquiescence in his uncle, rested not till he carried his purpose into execution, and as no immediate business required Mr. Allworthy's presence in the country, and little preparation is necessary to men for a journey, they set out the very next day, and arrived in town that evening, where Mr. Jones, as we have seen, was diverting himself with Partridge at the play. The morning after his arrival, Mr. Bluffel waited on Mr. Winston, by whom he was most kindly and graciously received, and from whom he had every possible assurance, perhaps more than was possible, that he should very shortly be as happy as Sophia could make him. Nor would the squire suffer the young gentleman to return to his uncle till he had, almost against his will, carried him to his daughter. End of Book 16, Chapters 4 to 6 Recording by Andy from Invernon M E L Y S dot W S